great to be here. Here's uh, I haven't even had a chance to say hi to Pastor Jimenez yet, so so there he is. Hi, Pastor Jimenez. <laughs> Thank you for having me. Red Hot Preaching Conference number nine. Can you believe it? I can't believe it. We were talking about on the way here. How many of you were at the first one? Raise your hand. Look at that. All right, number nine. Boy, we keep this up. We're gonna we're all gonna be old soon. All right, but that's okay. All right. Well, thank you for having me, Pastor Jimenez. It's great to be here. It's great to see you all here. Of course, I know uh, most of the faces here. I just want to just, everyone kept asking me. I don't know why when I came in. Even my wife asked me a couple times, like, are you nervous? And, you know, I don't know if I look nervous, but I'm always nervous preaching here. And the reason is because, you know, this conference is a big deal. Uh, this conference is a big deal. This church is a big deal. Pastor Jimenez is a big deal. All these pastors that are here are a big deal. It's just an honor uh, for me to always be here. Um, I still can't believe that, I've, that I'm preaching at this thing, even though I've preached here before. Um, what a great building, and uh, just really happy to be here. Now, just a little, uh, let's set some expectations on the sermon uh, before I even begin, all right? Um, I thought I would, this sermon isn't really funny, all right? So I just want to let you know right up front on that. I was going to start out with a couple jokes but I didn't want to misrepresent myself and then drop you off a cliff, all right? So I, my goal for this sermon this year at the Red Hot Preaching Conference, all joking aside, was to find something that would affect everybody in the building. I wanted to find a subject to preach on that wasn't something that maybe one person was struggling with and another person um, wasn't. I wanted to find something that hit everybody including myself. So what I did was I started with something that I think everybody wants because I know it's very important to me. And I started uh, with this premise and I built the sermon uh, from there. So I looked at something that everybody wants and I'm going to look at what the Bible says and I'm going to look at Proverbs chapter 17. I'm going to preach the whole sermon on one verse in Proverbs chapter 17. So the title of the sermon is the thing that I think Everyone in this building wants, whether you're a man, a woman, or a child in this building, the title of the sermon is Peace at Home. Peace at Home. When I think about something that's super important to me, peace at home comes to mind. Peace at home. I mean, when I just think about, you know, my life, I mean, what is, you know, to me, to me, the, the American dream to me is, is you, you find a pretty girl, you marry the pretty girl, you have children, you raise up those children in the, wor in, the, in the Lord, not in the world. You raise those children in the Lord, a, a church is a key part of that. You know, then you have children's children, as Proverbs uh, 17 is talking about, which I'm also looking forward to as well. But that, to me, is the American dream. That's my, that peace at home, at the, in the home is where all that happens. In the home is where all those things that are so important to me and so important to you reside. And having peace there is what it's all about for all of us, I hope. And to have peace there is super important. I, my wife called me a couple days ago and she said, uh, she said that uh, Jacob needs help digging a hole in the backyard for a rabbit. And I was like, okay. So I find myself for some reason, with a pickaxe, a sledgehammer, and a crowbar, you know, smashing rocks through this soil yesterday morning for hours, digging a hole for a rabbit that I've never even met. <laughs> but that is what it's all about. And I was thinking about this sermon when I was swinging that sledgehammer, and I was like, peace at home, American dream. Peace at home, American dream. <laughs> but seriously, though, don't forget those moments. That's what it's about. It's about digging holes for rabbits. It's about loving your wife, loving your children, raising them up how the Bible says they should be raised up in a peaceful environment. We all want peace at home. My home, your home, men. And I, I'm going to speak from a man's perspective, of course. But look, it doesn't matter what's going on in the world if I have peace in my home. If I have peace in my home, my home is my fortress of solitude. I can be going through the worst garbage in the world, and you men know what I'm talking about, and you have peace at home, and it's all okay, and you can do anything. I can handle anything. That being said, this whole sermon is on preserving this, this peace at home. 
So let me ask you, before we even begin, do you have peace at home? Do you have peace at home tonight? If you do, I'm going to show you how to keep it. If you don't have peace at home, I'm going to show you how to gain it or how to get it back. That's my goal for the sermon tonight. Look down at Proverbs chapter number 17. Let's get into the Bible here. This is a very short verse in the Bible, as most Proverbs are, but they're packed with wisdom. Look at Proverbs 17, verse number 13. The Bible says this, it says, Whoso rewardeth evil for good, evil shall not depart from his house. I want to show you how evil not departing from your house is the opposite of peace at home. It's quite a concept listed in this verse. Whoso rewardeth evil for good, evil shall not depart from from his house. Look at Genesis chapter 6, if you would. Let's define evil um, real quickly. Let's do a short Bible study so we understand exactly what this verse is saying. But evil can mean a couple different things in the Bible. Evil can mean wickedness, and evil can mean just trouble. Look at Genesis chapter 6, verse number 5. The Bible says, And God saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Kind of compare, uh, equating evil with wickedness there. But now turn, if you would, to Jonah chapter 3 and verse number 10. This is a common verse if you're a soul winner. Hopefully you know this verse, but I'm going to show you something cool about it. In Isaiah 45 verse 7, I'll just read for you. The Bible says this about evil. It says, I form the light. God says, I form the light and create darkness. I make peace and create evil. I, the Lord, do all these things. So there's many places in the Bible where God brought evil upon people. Where God is the one that is delivering or bringing the evil. Look at Jonah chapter 3 and verse number 10. The cool thing about Jonah 3, 10 is we see kind of both, both kinds of evil used in the same verse. And it says, And God saw their works that they turned from their evil way, meaning their wickedness that they were doing, and God repented of the evil... This means trouble, judgment, that he said that he would do unto them and did it not. So we see the evil way with sin and wickedness, but then we see God's evil that he was going to bring. God can't bring sin. God can't bring wickedness. It's just talking about judgment, destruction, bad things that people deserved. Now go back to Proverbs chapter 17. So the crime... We're going to look at the crime, and we're going to look at the punishment. And then we're going to apply it to each of us tonight. The crime in Proverbs chapter 17 is rewarding something. Now that we know what evil is and what evil can mean, just bad things, rewarding someone who has done you good with bad. It's taking someone that's done good to you and doing something bad in return. You say, what in the world? I would never do that. Yeah, we'll see. We'll see. We'll get into some practical application here in just a few minutes. But that's the crime. The crime is taking someone that has done you good and rewarding and returning back upon them bad things. But the punishment is this. Whoso rewardeth evil for good, evil shall not depart from his house. The Bible is telling us if you do this, Somebody that has done you good and you reward them with bad things back. If you do this, evil shall not depart from your house. And that's going to be evil from the Lord right there. That's going to be judgment from God. Look, that's serious. Because already I could tell and already it's important to me, I know it's important to you that we want peace in our house. I don't want trouble in my house. I don't want evil to come into my house. Turn to John chapter 16. Look, I expect trouble in certain places in my life. I expect trouble. Jesus tells the disciples, the Bible tells us again and again, expect trouble. The disciples ask Jesus, why do you keep telling us all these bad things are going to happen? He's like, so you're not offended. So when bad things do happen, you're not, you're not, you're not surprised. You're not like, why, did, why didn't God tell me this? Look at John 16 and verse number 33. Jesus says, These things have I spoken unto you, that in me you might have peace. Does he say that you're going to have peace everywhere? He says, in me you will have peace. 
In the world ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. You see, I expect trouble and I expect evil in the world. I do not expect it in my house. I do not want it in my house. Look, if you go out and you're, if you're a business owner or you do business in this backwards world that we live in, you better expect trouble out there. There's trouble all over in this world. I mean, you would better expect, this is the problem with the younger generations that are coming up. They don't expect any trouble. And then the smallest thing happens and they fall over on their face. You had better expect trouble. That's what Jesus is saying. In the world, you're going to have tribulation. You're going to have all kinds of trouble. In this world, people will cheat you. People will cheat you. People will, go, people will bend over backwards to scam you and rip you off. Sometimes I wonder, you look at these scams and all these things that are coming in email and phone calls and all these different things, people stopping by your house, and you're like, wouldn't it just be easier to get a job? I mean, everything is a scam. I mean, you have to look cross-eyed at every single thing that comes your way these days. People will steal from you. Look, I love, I love California. I love it here. This is the best place that I have ever lived in my life. But people will steal the shirt off your back here if you're not careful. I'm telling you. I went to buy a 9-volt battery today, and it was locked in a case behind the counter. I'm like, it's $4. But the point is this. The point is, you know, there's gonna, you're going to have trouble out there, folks. Expect it. People will lie to you. They'll cheat you. They'll persecute you. They'll persecute you when you start separating and start walking your faith. When you stop being fearful about what the Bible says and you start being faithful and actually doing those things that God wants you to do. People will persecute you for that. Expect it. That's what Jesus is saying. They'll, but at home, I don't expect it at home. This is why family problems are so devastating to people. This is why things like divorce... Trouble with children. This is why those types of things just crush people. Because even a Christian that expects trouble in the world and tribulation in the world, they're not ready for that, that devastating blow of when the peace at home falls apart. Turn to 2 Samuel chapter number 12. But for this sin, we're talking about the crime and the punishment. For this sin of rewarding someone that has done good to you with evil, God will remove the peace from your home. That is serious. And that's what I'm trying to get you to see in the first few minutes of this sermon. God brings the trouble home from the Lord. Let me give you some biblical proofs. And look, I can't spend as much time as I'd like to, because this is all over the Bible, where God brings the trouble home to people. Look at 2 Samuel chapter number 12. 2 Samuel chapter number 12, look at verse number 9. This is the, the story about David and Uriah. Everyone has heard this story. David and Uriah, look at verse number 9. He's getting rebuked here by the prophet of God. Wherefore, hast thou despised the commandment of the Lord to do evil in his sight? This is the man of God rebuking David, thou hast killed Uriah the Hittite with the sword, and hast taken his wife to be thy wife, and hast slain him with the sword of the children of Ammon. Now therefore, look at this, shall the, shall, now therefore the sword shall never depart from thine house, because thou hast despised me and taken of the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be thy wife. What did David do? This is preached all the time. Murder and adultery. That's what he did. But through those are terrible sins. But if you want to just put a package on that, on what David did, you know what he did? He took this man, and for this man, for Uriah's loyalty, he stole his wife. For Uriah's courage, he murdered him. He rewarded him, someone that had done him very good, he rewarded him with evil. 
And you know, the, the unique thing about David here is he actually used the good that Uriah gave to the nation of Israel, the courage of this man who would run to the front lines and fight for his country. He used that very good to kill him. And what was the punishment? The punishment that the sword would never leave David's house. And we see this come to pass in David's life. Turn to 1 Samuel chapter 19. 1 Samuel chapter number 19. Ironically, ironically, David was repeating behavior that was actually done to him. Look at 1 Samuel chapter number 19. 1 Samuel chapter 19, look at verse number 4. And Jonathan, this is Saul's son. Saul is the king before David. Saul's having some problems with David, who just saved the nation, by the way. And Jonathan spake good of David unto Saul his father, and said unto him, Let not the king sin against his servant, against David, because he had not sinned against thee, and because his works have been to thee very good. You know what he's saying to his dad? Don't reward someone that did you good with evil. For he did put his life in his hand and slew the Philistine. And the Lord wrought a great salvation for all Israel. Thou sawest it, and didst rejoice. Wherefore then will thou sin against innocent blood to slay David without a cause? And Saul hearkened unto the voice of Jonathan. He listened for a while. And Saul sware, as the Lord liveth, he shall not be slain. And Jonathan called David. And Jonathan showed him all those things. And Jonathan brought David to Saul. And he was in his presence as in times past. And there was war again, and David went out and fought with the Philistines and slew them with a great slaughter. Again, more good that David is doing. And they fled from him. And the evil spirit of the Lord was upon Saul. As he sat in his house with his javelin in his hand, and David played with his hand. Don't forget where the evil spirit that Saul had came from. This isn't a demon that we're talking about here. This is a spirit, this is a bad judgmental spirit that God gave to Saul. You'll notice that the evil spirit from the Lord is what Saul had. Saul was under judgment for rewarding evil to someone who had done him good. And Saul sought to smite David even to the wall with the javelin, but he slipped away out of Saul's presence, and he smote the javelin into the wall, and David fled and escaped that night. What happened to the house of Saul? What happened to Saul and his sons? They were killed. Even after Saul's death, peace did not leave his house. Even after Saul's death, Saul was judged, his family was judged for him rewarding the Gibeonites evil. Seven more of his sons died in that case. Look, the problem is that God rewarded Saul. He took the, he took the peace from Saul's house because he rewarded someone that did him good. With evil, I could go on and on and on about stories in the Bible where God removes peace from someone's house. And we'll look at another one in just a few minutes. But let's look at some practical application. Because, you know, you're looking at these cases, and I can see your faces. You're like, this, these are extreme. These people are crazy. They're murdering people. They're committing adultery. I would never do something like that. I would never reward good with evil. This doesn't apply to me. I think let's have a little thought experiment here. What if I asked Brother Vladi to bring me a water? I bet you he would. You don't have to, Brother Vladi. But what if I asked Brother Vladi, bring me a water up here, and then he brought me a water, and I just took the water, and I just dumped it on his head right in front of everybody in the whole church. And you're all, I mean, Brother Vladi's generally not somebody that you would do that to. But <laughs> the point is, I, he did something good to me, and I would just be directly rewarding him with evil. And you're like, that's egregious. Nobody would ever do that. I would never do something that egregious. But here's the problem. What about somebody that did you good years ago? Is there a statue? Go back to, uh, go back to Proverbs 17 in verse number 13 and let's look for the statute of limitations on good here. There's two problems with saying that this doesn't apply to me and the first one is there is no statute of limitations on people that have done good to you. Which leads us to the real problem in our lives, which is we forget the good that people do to us. We get in the flesh, and when we want to reward evil, we, we don't even think about the good. 
We forget about the good. Maybe the good was from the past. Maybe the good was last week or last year or whatever. But we forget about that when we're rewarding evil to people. Let's look at specific examples. Let's start with your marriage tonight. You know when peace leaves a marriage? You ever seen a marriage where peace is gone? You ever seen a marriage where they're still married? But the peace is gone. The peace is gone from that marriage. You know what? In every single case where you have a marriage where peace has left that marriage, I guarantee you one or both has forgotten the good and is returning evil. That's the problem. Can any husband or wife, no matter what the current state of their marriage is, can any husband or wife honestly say that their husband or their wife has never done them good? Give me a break. Unless you were forced to get married at gunpoint or something like that. Like every single wife has done good to her husband. Every single husband has done good to his wife. But we forget the good. And then we feel justified that we can return evil. Turn to Matthew chapter 5. The examples in a marriage that I could go through here are nearly infinite. But I picked one for a husband and I picked one for a wife. Two that are, in my opinion, major issues in marriages today. Turn to Matthew chapter 5. Let's start with the men. Let me give you an example of a man rewarding his wife and the good that this person that has done him good with evil. Look at Matthew chapter number 5 and verse number 28. Matthew chapter 5, look at verse number 28. The Bible says, Jesus says, But I say unto you, that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. Now, I like to keep track of stats as a pastor, and I keep seeing certain stats keep going in the wrong direction, especially in this country. Here's one for you. 70%, and look, when I say Christian, and I look at these polls, and I get that Christian is not Bible-believing Christian. I get that the word Christian is abused today. I understand that. But it's still disturbing. 70% of Christian men regularly look at pornography. You know what that tells me? Look, hey, we're different than that Christian. We're Bible-believing Christians. We're soul winners. We're three to thrive. We're at the Red Hot Preaching Conference. But I guarantee you there's multiple men in this church that this affects. And you know what this is? Your wife stays home. Your wife has your children. Your wife loves you. She raises your children, and you return evil to her by betraying her. Say goodbye to peace in your home. I mean, there are so many things that men do not think about on this subject. Go to Proverbs chapter 15. Kiss peace in your home goodbye. You think of Solomon and all the other men in the Bible that had multiple wives. Now you show me a man in the Bible that had multiple wives that had a great relationship with one of them. You will not find it. Solomon. He wrote Song of Solomon. Young Solomon wrote Song of Solomon. You read Song of Solomon and you're like, should I be reading this? It's like some love letter between a man and his first wife. And then you read Ecclesiastes, where old Solomon, after he's married hundreds of women, where old Solomon says, one man in a thousand I've found, but I, who could find a good woman? He lost the peace in his marriage because he betrayed his wife. Here's another problem. Here's another problem that men have in this area. There's a lot of sins that people wear on their face. There's a lot of sin, like, you know, being a drunkard, people know you're a drunkard. They do. If you're a pothead, people know you're a pothead, bro. <laughs> if you're covetous, people know that you're covetous. Because all you do is talk about money. If you're glutton, people know. 
But here's the thing about pornography. These men think no one knows. But look at Proverbs 15.3. The eyes of the Lord are in every place, beholding the evil and the good. It's God that knows. And guess what? It is God that removes the peace. He sees everything. And he is the one in Proverbs 17, 13 that removes the peace. It's a huge miss to think no one knows. You wonder why you don't have peace in your marriage. Maybe that's why. Because God sees everything and he's the one that does the removing of that peace. Turn to Proverbs chapter 31. Let's look at the ladies. Proverbs chapter 31. Here's one for the wives. Look at Proverbs chapter 31 and verse number 12. Proverbs chapter 31. We're talking about the virtuous woman, this picture-perfect woman that Solomon's mother is trying to, you know, tell him to find. And it's this beautiful chapter in the Bible that shows women, here's what God wants of you. Look at verse number 12. She will do him good and not evil. You see that? She will do him good and not evil when he's doing well. Here's one for the ladies. An example of wives, and I, I, I see this way too much. You see it a lot in the world, and God forbid you would ever see it in a Christian marriage, but you see it there too. The fair-weather wife. She will do him good and not evil all the days of her life. Look, I don't know who the most awesome husband is in this church tonight, but let me tell you ladies something. Even the most awesome husband in this room tonight, he will not always be winning. There are successes and there are failures in this life. There are successes and there are failures in the Christian life. There are times... I mean, this verse in Proverbs 31.12 is Proverbs 17.13 applied by this woman. She does him good in the bad times and the good times. This man's no slouch. He sits in the gates. He's no slouch to be able to marry a virtuous woman. I mean, I've always said, like, you know, Cadillacs don't marry Volkswagens. So this man's no slouch, but you know what? There is going to be times in every man's life when he makes good decisions and he makes bad ones. When he's spiritually strong and he's spiritually weak. When he's physically strong and physically weak. That's why it's so hard for many times for a daughter to see her dad get older. Because there's this man that in her mind is so strong, and then when her dad gets older, approaching the end of his life, it's very hard for a daughter to see you know, her, her, this person whose physical strength and strength in all ways get weak. But your husband will not always be strong. But as long as she is breathing, this woman... She will only do him good. And let me tell you ladies something. She'll always have his back. Let me tell you, ladies, uh, an insight into men. It is great to be appreciative of the blessings of a, of a hardworking spiritual leader as a husband. It is great to be appreciative of those things. But let me tell you what is more valuable to me. I am so happy when my wife and my children appreciate the blessings that I am able to provide God willing for my family. I am super appreciative that they understand and they see those things. But what is more important to me, when I look back at my marriage over, over the last 25 years, the most valuable times in my marriage was when my wife did me good when I was down. Those are the times that I remember like they were yesterday. And those are the times that just cemented that, what is this husband in Proverbs 31? It says his heart just safely trusts in her. And those are the times that make my, that just, they, they solidified that trust that I have in my wife. I'm glad she appreciates things. 
And, and I'm sure you men are glad when your wife doesn't take things for granted and your children don't think, but it's the bad times. It's when he lost his job. It's when he's down and out, when things aren't going well, when it looks like he can't figure it out, when he looks like he's flailing and you're still there doing good. Those are the times that he'll remember when, when he's 90. He'll remember those times. That's how valuable those things are. And you sit there and you say, well, my husband's not doing right. You know what? Find the good. That's what this woman does. Find the good. Remember the good. Remember the good and focus on that. That is the key. This Proverbs 31 woman, just she remembers the good and she always focuses on it. If you sit there and you listen to this and you say, well, he doesn't deserve it. He's doing the wrong thing. Then goodbye peace. That's what I'm trying to get across to you tonight. Here's another one for you. How about this? Your parents. Maybe you got, got some things right in your life. Maybe you got saved later in life. Whatever. Maybe you just are raising your own children and you realize some mistakes were made and you're making some corrections with your own family according to your study and learning of the Word of God. And you start to think, my parents made a lot of mistakes. And you start to think, they haven't done me good. And you start to think, they don't deserve my respect. Really? I think you need to fix your perspective. You are here. You're breathing. Did you know that one in four women in the United States in this country will murder at least one of their children? Think about that next time you're in the grocery store line. One, two, three, murderer. One, two, three, murderer. I don't mean to be bleak, but hey, mom, thanks for not killing me. I know that's a low bar, but it's something. Especially in a country where you can pop a pill and it's perfectly legal to kill your own child. That's a good thing that they didn't kill you. Look, and it's much more than that. Focus on character. Focus on the care that you were given. You know, focus on, you know, look, fix the mistakes with your family. Fix the mistakes going forward. Learn the Bible. Fix those things. Change course where it needs to change. But you don't need to smash mistakes in your parents' face. Hey, Dad, thanks for working so hard all those years to support us. Hey, Mom, thanks for being there, even if she wasn't there every time. Thanks for being there that time that you were. Find the good. Focus on that. Don't return evil. And if you hear this and you say, now they deserve chastisement and disrespect, say goodbye to your peace in your home. How about your pastor? Has your pastor done good to you? Has your pastor, has he cared for you? Has he prayed for you? Has he given counsel to you? Have him and his wife just stayed up late at night worrying about you and just beseeching the Lord for you? Has he preached the word of God to you and you return evil to him? Oh, he made a bad decision. Look, I... I, I got news for you. I'm a, I've been a pastor for a couple years now. I don't consider myself super experienced by any measure of, of any bar. But, you know, I don't think that I make every decision perfectly every single time. I'm just a man. Your pastor is just a man. You know, I, don't, I didn't like that sermon. I don't like the way this church runs. This church is too big. This church is too small. People will come visit us sometimes and they'll be like, well, I, I like how this church is small. And I'm like, well, we're not trying to be small. <laughs> so, you know, don't come back next year because we're getting bigger and bigger and pretty soon you're not going to like it at some point, whatever that point is. But the point is, your pastor has definitely done good to you. There should be nothing that you are returning to your pastor except good. Turn to 1 Kings chapter 14. 1 Kings chapter number 14. 
I can go on and on and on, but let's look at one more. How about this one? How about your God? Your God. Has your God done good to you? Look at 1 Kings chapter number 14. 1 Kings chapter number 14. God is talking to Jeroboam right after the split. And God says this. He says, go tell Jeroboam, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, For as much as I have exalted thee from among the people, and made thee prince over my people Israel. So what is God saying? The man of God is saying, God lifted you up. God put you in this exalted spot and rent the kingdom away from the house of David. This is Rehoboam and gave it thee. Yet thou hast not been as my servant David who kept my commandments and who followed me with all his heart to do that which was right in mine eyes. But thou hast done what? Has done evil above all that were before thee. For thou hast gone and made thee other gods and molten images to provoke me to anger and to cast me behind thy back. So he's saying, I set you up, buddy. I picked you up. I blessed you. See where I'm going with this? He's like, I blessed you. And what did you do? You went and you created other gods. And how, how stupid it is, there is no other gods. And for this, look at verse number 10. Therefore, behold, I will bring evil upon the house of Jeroboam. And will cut off from Jeroboam him that pisseth against the wall, him that is shut up and left in Israel, and will take away the remnant of the house of Jeroboam. He's like, this dynasty is done. This house is done. As a man taketh away dung till it be all gone. Look, the punishment on Jeroboam for returning evil after God did him well, returning evil back to God, was judgment on his home, on his family. Just as Proverbs 17, 13 is talking. What did he do? And look, I get that there's a proportional response here. I mean, I don't think that if you go and you gossip about your friend that God's going to completely destroy everyone in your family. There's a proportional response. We're looking at some major issues here in the Bible, but the methodology is the same. The methodology is the same. What did Jeroboam do? He took God's blessings and he used them against God. God himself. Look, I tell my church members this all the time. So if you're from Hold Fast Baptist Church, you're going to hear it again. But I tell my church members this all the time. I hope God blesses you. Unless you can't handle the blessings, then I hope he doesn't. If the successes that God gives you, that God would bless you with, will start to take the place of your spiritual life, will start to remove God from that pedestal that he must stay on. Look, it's not that hard, folks. Take the blessings. Leave God there. Take the blessings, though. Learn how to take a blessing in your life. So God doesn't have to, you don't have to go through this cycle like this. If you can't take the blessings, I hope he doesn't bless you. Because if you take God's blessings and you return him evil for the good that he did for you, say goodbye to the peace in your home. And church members, I want you to have peace in your home. I want you to have peace in your home more than I want you to have some blessing at work or wherever else it is. I want you all to have peace in your home. And look, folks, this is Christianity maybe 201 because a lot of people seem to make this mistake. Not every opportunity is from God. Not every door that is put in front of you is one you should walk through. But people will do that. They're like, well, the, the promotion was there, and, and you know, that just meant I, I just had to, you know, not go to church anymore, and just I got to take a break for a year or whatever. It's just like, what in the world? Is it, does preaching not work with you? I hope God blesses you. But if you can't handle the blessing and you're going to remove God off the pedestal, I hope he doesn't because peace in your home is more important to me and I know it's more important to your pastor. And guess what? It's more important to your wife, it's more important to your husband, and it's definitely more important to your children than any opportunity that you think is an opportunity that's not. If you see something that takes God off the pedestal, you get away as fast as you can. <laughs> this, folks, this applies to everyone in your life, not just your marriage, your wife, your husband, your children, 
It's everyone in your life, anyone that you would ever meet. I could go on and on and on, but I want to give you some solutions tonight. I want to give you some solutions on how you can not do this. I'm going to give you a couple methodologies. Let's look at one. First of all, how could I make sure this is so serious, and I believe you, Pastor Pizarnski, that I don't ever want to fall into this trap. How can I do it? Well, here's the first thing you could do. You could keep track of the good. Let's, let's, let's walk through this thought experiment and see if this one works out. Turn to Proverbs chapter 27. Maybe I'll just keep a running list. I know most people in this church. You know, I know, I know most of the people that I'm looking at here tonight. Maybe I'll just make a list of all the people that have done me good. And then as soon as somebody does something to me where I want to really get them, I'll just check and see if they're on my list. You see where I'm going? I mean, it seems logical. Here's the problem. Look at Proverbs 27 and verse number 2. What if you miss one? That's the problem. What? I mean, do you know all the good that has been done to you? Look at Proverbs 27, 2. The Bible says this, Let another man praise thee, and not thine own mouth, a stranger, and not thine own lips. Do you know, look, I get it, we live in a world of self-centered idiots. We live in a world of fake personas and people trying to make a name for themselves left and right. But you know, there are people out there that will do good to you and not tell you about it. And they won't come up and announce it to you. I knew this kid one time, years ago. This young kid, I was on this interview plan panel, and this young kid was interviewing for this job. We really couldn't find anybody for this job. And this kid interviewed, and there was this, the most senior guy in the room just said, you know what, let's give this kid a chance. And so we hired this kid. And he comes on, and it's interesting because he comes on, and within the first few months, he is just butting heads with this senior-level guy that got him the job, basically. And I just kept thinking to myself, I just kept thinking to myself, man, you, you fool. You wouldn't even be here if it wasn't for that guy. And you're butting heads with this guy. And eventually, this kid, his problems kind of worked themselves out with himself. And he wasn't there too much longer. But so much for the list is what I'm trying to get you to see. Because you don't know all the people that have done good to you. Turn back to Matthew chapter 5. The only real foolproof answer is to not return evil. As just, a, as just a way of life, as just a philosophy, ever. And you're like, whoa. Look at Matthew chapter 5 and look at verse number 38. Look, the Bible teaches this. Jesus teaches this. Look what he says in verse number 38. He says, you have heard that it had been said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say unto you that, you resist, that ye resist not evil. He's like, don't fight. Don't fight against the people that are doing bad to you. But whatsoever, whosoever shall smite thee on the right cheek, turn him also the other also. If any man will sue thee at the law and take away thy coat, let him have thy cloak also. And whosoever shall compel thee to go a mile, go with him twain. He's saying, go to. Give to him that asketh thee, and from him that would borrow of thee, turn not thou away. Look, Jesus is just saying, just don't return evil no matter what. I mean, then you say, like, well, what about somebody that just does nothing but bad to me? This just, like, abuses me and just, well, look, stay away is the response there. That's separation for you. You know, that's where you should separate from things like that. But, and that's another thing, a note for people that return evil. If you constantly return evil to, you, to other people, people will stop doing good to you. So the point is this, if you can do these two things, if you can avoid people that would only harm you, and then you can just never reward evil, you will have peace at home. And guess what, folks? In addition to peace at home, you're, I mean, you're going to be someone that does good to people. You're going to be someone that generally people are going to like you. And guess what? Here's another one. You'll raise nice kids. Who doesn't want nice kids? You ever met kids that are just mean? They're just, they're just don't, it doesn't seem like they have a good heart. They're just mean. They're just upset. They're just angry all the time. You know why? No peace at home. That's why. That's the difference. 
There's more going on there. Part of peace at home is peaceful children. Part of peaceful, peace at home is a peaceful wife. You look at the guy and was it Proverbs chapter 21 that he's, what is he doing? He's up on the corner of his house. What's he doing up there? You're like, what are you doing up there? What are you doing up in the corner of the house? You know what he's doing? He's looking for peace. The guy 10 verses later, the guy 10 verses later, he's, he's out, he, he couldn't even find it in the corner of the house. He's out in the wilderness. What's he doing out there? He's looking for peace out there. I've met that very man. He's always out in the wilderness. Every single weekend he's hunting. I'm like, don't you have a family? What's going on? Don't you want to go home ever? He's like, no, I'm sleeping out here. Peace at home. Peace at home means you'll have peaceful children. Peace at home means you'll have a peaceful wife. You'll have a peaceful marriage. Look, it's a carrot. It's a carrot that God is dangling in front of us to not reward evil in our lives. It's a reward. It's a reward for suppressing that carnal instinct to get them. I'm going to get them. I'm going to say this. I got, the, I got the thing to say. I mean, there's some witty people out there. You've you been on the internet? There's some witty people out there. But it's a reward. This peace at home is a carrot that God is putting in front of us. It's a big one to just suppress that instinct to exact revenge is what God is teaching us. And look, personally, personally, folks, I'll take the peace. Every single time, every single day. Because if I have that, I know I can do anything. If I have that peace at home with my wife and with my children, nothing, nothing matters to me if I have that. And I'm sure all the husbands in the room feel that same way. If you, that's how powerful it is. But if that peace leaves, I'm telling you, I'm in trouble I'm in trouble if that peace leaves. So I want it to stay. And you're telling me that I can preserve it through my own actions? Sounds like something that we should pay attention to. Look, I want you to reflect. I want you to reflect tonight. I want you to reflect on your home. I want you to reflect on the peace or lack of peace that you have in your home with your children, with your wife, with your husband. If there's anything wrong there, the trouble may be coming from the Lord. I want you to think about that, and if you find it, confess it, fix it, and bring home the peace again. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer.